welcome to the Dreamers Edge Podcast. This is Chris, uh, subtitle editor, occasional writer. Eric, teacher, writer, lover. Nicholas, I write great game reviews for the DreamersEdge.com. And I'm Dimitri, webmaster of the DreamersEdge.com and lover as well. I'll bait, not Eric's. <laughs> I'm glad to hear it. It's always nice to know. <laughs> <laughs> Spoiler, guys, come on. <laughs> All right, so we are continuing our journey down cinematic history, and we've reached the 70s, which is going to be a little bit tougher for some of us, because some of us were barely alive in that decade. Uh, others of us are really old. <laughs> <laughs> so what we're going to do is we're going to list our top three movies of the 70s, each of us, respectively. The 70s. <laughs> <laughs> Like, I'm looking at the movies that were made, and it's becoming harder to, in a way, find a bad movie because it's easy to find the bad movies from last year because I watched them. Mm. You know what I mean? But yeah. to actually stumble on a movie from the 70s where it's bad, you know what I mean? Like, it, you have to consciously go out and choose it, you know? Yeah. So it's, there's less of a chance for that unless you kind of stumble on it on, like, a television you know, channel or whatever. You know what I mean? Like, and obviously, they're out there, and there's so many bad movies. But the thing is, when you look at these lists, you're like, these are all good movies. Oh my God. You know? <laughs> and it makes it seem like they didn't do anything bad, but they did so many bad things. But in my own mind, you know what I mean? I think this is kind of like a sweet decade. You know, it's just like, um, it doesn't have that strangeness from the sixties. It doesn't have the awkwardness of the eighties. And it's just like, it's right there in a period where there's enough technology to do some science fiction, but they keep the scale down. So they actually, can make an interesting film without kind of overreaching. Mm. There's a lot of practical effects, which is interesting. There's a lot of really good crime drama, which I like. And mm. a lot yeah, of... Yeah, I know. You know. I thought about some of those as well. And it's also the period where you've got a lot of these directors or auteurs that we're still watching today, you know yeah. what I mean, are coming into their own and they're young and they're energetic and they're just like wanting to break into the, the field. You know what I mean? So I, I actually enjoyed looking through the list. I found this one a really hard decade to do. Like, I don't yeah, know you... yeah, yeah. I found it hard to distill it to three movies because I would have picked The French Connection, which I think is an awesome film. The movie that created the car chase sequence. Absolutely. Yeah. And to this day, you still watch it and you're like, wow, this is smart. This is exciting. Oh my God. Papa is such a badass. Um, and it kind of also made me kind of learn a little bit of what was the cop back then. Right. Uh, but that that was a very exciting film. And a bit like you, I had a hard time like distilling, like, oh, which film am I going to talk about? This one or this one or this one? And what I love about it, it was it's such an eclectic mix. Yeah. yeah. It was civil unrest. It was... Uh, it was like you just mentioned now, it was sort of post-60s, so you had the experimental drive of the 60s, but people were starting to sober up. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's exploitation cinema and all that. It's, oh, it's, yeah. It was people just trying things out. And because there were so many things being tried out with, you know, 40 years of distance to look at it, we can actually easily pinpoint which experiments worked and changed cinematic history, you know? All right, that's... Moderator, start it up. Actually, right. I'm going to start it up because I'm not a movie person, so I don't want my picks to be duplicated by other people because <laughs> I can't really on the fly switch and find other ones, so I'm going to be the one starting. Right, so <laughs> what you're saying is you're flying without backup every time. Exactly. So it's not that these are your three favorite movies. These are just the three movies you know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, have more, I have more favorites, but, you know, I, I had a lot of work in figuring out my three favorite ones, you know. All right, go ahead. Okay, go ahead. My first one uh, is a classic, uh, Jaws. I uh, really like that movie. See, they, uh, on the one way, it's a good pick. On the other, it's such a, an obvious pick. I'm really disappointed. I know. It's, a, it's an obvious pick, but it's, it's a movie that yeah, yeah, yeah. I really enjoyed watching. And unfortunately, yeah, yeah. the series went downhill <laughs> after that one. But uh, it is really a movie I would watch every time it's on TV. Really? Even though, yeah, even though I know what's going to happen. I pretty much know that movie by heart by now. It's it's a movie I, I love watching. I'll tell you this: it's got chops. Oh. Wow! <laughs> <laughs> oh. Jaws, we've talked about it before. I think Jaws is the 
perfect blockbuster for that period and it really I, I think it did kind of kick off like that blockbuster mentality yeah it is usually considered as the yeah. first American blockbuster apart from yeah. uh, but, but in terms of its cinematic rollout it did go from city to city so it's not the same as now where it's like opening on Friday on 3,000 theaters you know what I mean like this one did kind of go with word of mouth um, and it just it gained through just you know like the reviews and just like people started going it became almost like event movies <laughs> And it benefited from it, and things it does stand out. The shark not being shown until the end of the movie is often considered like the genius of Jaws, which is kind of funny because it was sort of accidental because the, yeah. the rubber yeah. shark just didn't work. Yeah, the thing is that that means the director was smart, is what it yeah. comes down to. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, it's just like they'd invested the money, he saw it, he was like, okay, we've got to change what we're doing. And the thing is, they kept the story going, there was some money invested, you know, and they worked around it and they came up. Yeah. with a good story because of that and you know more than space more than a lot of things you know you know just personally speaking you know what i mean like that sense of open water and whatever's underneath i find really frightening you know what i mean so the fact that you don't see it is even scarier like you know it's out there it could touch your toe it could bite your leg off you don't know how deep it is you can't really defend against it it really kind of taps into that primal fear and the way the community kind of like gets more and more scared as the storyline goes you know like it I thought it builds well to a good, you know, satisfying dramatic conclusion. Yeah. I had heard that Spielberg didn't want to see the shark in the first, like, 45 minutes. That was his deal. Now you're telling me it's because it didn't work, not yeah, because... No, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, what a liar in his interviews, then. No, no, I mean, he's <laughs> no but the... he's good at that. He adapts himself to whatever, and here's the thing. He's a good filmmaker. Whatever you throw at him, he's going to think of an interesting way to show it to you. So, uh, Spielberg, for that, I do think he's a master. Well, it's a good example of what cinema is, which is yeah. a collaboration. You know, exactly. Like he collaborated with his special effects people. They gave him something. He's like, I can't work with this. <laughs> 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 We're going to keep it underwater until the last month. You know what I mean? But by then, you're invested in the story, so you're fine. You see the flash of it. You're like, okay, yeah. I'm, I'm invested. You know, I just want to see where, where the characters go. And I, I, it ended up being a smart move. You know what I mean? I don't yeah. know if the movie would have been as effective if you saw the monster from the beginning. I'm convinced that it wouldn't have been, in fact. <laughs> Uh, not least because it's a movie that w is effective mostly because when they go hunting for the shark and all hell breaks loose, you know these characters very, very well. And that's because the opening 45 minutes spends all its time on actually establishing who they are instead of what you would find today, sort of cutting away every once in a while for one of them to get knocked off, you know? Right. All right. For my number two, it's actually a made-for-TV movie. Ooh. Which is yeah. When when today when we think of made for TV movies, do we think of like made for sci fi specials or you know? No, I'm actually thinking of a Warner premiere original starring whatever tween star of the day yeah, doing exactly. a Cinderella remake. I'm Something. thinking of Tiffany and yes, <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and in some sort of animal cross breeding experiment gone wrong. Indeed. Or twins separated at birth. What? Go ahead. What's your oh, yeah. name? It's called Duel. And it's basically a guy that's riding home and he gets pretty much attacked by a tanker truck that basically tries to kill him for like two hours. And the guy doesn't know what's happening. There's no exactly... I think he knows the tanker truck's trying yeah. to kill him. He knows the tanker truck's hanging. He doesn't know why. He doesn't know who's driving a tanker truck. And it was made for TV by lesser known director, Spielberg, again. And it got such high success that they actually released it in theaters afterwards. Really? Yeah. Like a couple of months later, I was like, wow, that, that, that got super high rating. Let's release it in theaters, which is completely opposite what would happen today. Any, any model yeah. that we would be able to get to now. That's interesting. Yeah. Again, uh, Steven Spielberg, whenever I see one of his films, I always think he's a very, very good at visually portraying and even telling a story. I like the way he tells a story. Uh, Here's my little quibble with him. Ever since he became a producer, he doesn't know how to finish his films anymore. Mm -hmm. There's about like three or four endings to whatever film he's doing now. Uh, but uh, back then, at this time when he was uh, young and vibrant, like uh, I did like it. I thought he was a great producer on Transformers. Yeah, <laughs> I think it really ended. My patience for the franchise. Yeah. But, <laughs> um, I have nothing to say about that movie. And what I find interesting, though, is that you put it uh, on top of Jaws, uh, meaning that you consider it a better movie than Jaws. Yeah, because it's not sure known. I want to make something special, you know. You were disappointed with my Jaws pick because it, it's pretty much, you know, 
run of the mill. So I'm trying to do a little more special now. I see. Yeah. So you wanted to start the show with a lame ass thing. All right. Okay. No. <laughs> better than finishing it, you know. With lame. But, number yeah, one pick. <laughs> number one pick. All right. Sorry. I'm going back again to like a, a classic. Oh. Sorghum Green. Ah. Uh, basically, it's in the future where all the resources of the Earth are being used because there's so much population. It's kind of a murder mystery that, you know, eventually turns out into something bigger. You know, you, you think it's just the murder of somebody, you know, a rich a person that works in the corporation, but it turns out to be like a lot more. Trotness is, is working on uh, investigating that. And it's, uh, it's a great movie. It's a good twist. Here's my question to you, because I've, I've seen it, but I haven't watched it since. You know what I mean? And it's a movie that's so dependent on that twist, in a way. Mm -hmm. Have you seen it more than once? Does it really, does it hold up to a second viewing, or...? It doesn't really hold up to the second viewing. That's why I'm saying it, you know, watch it the first time. If you don't know the twist, okay. it's great. Okay. The second time, you kind of have to focus on the rest of the movie, which is, it's okay. Okay. See, I actually disagree. I, I think it does hold up on this okay. on second viewing because a large portion of the movie is dedicated to actually exploring the lives of these people during the investigation, especially Charlton Heston character and his relationships. And there's this permeating uh, sense of desperation that sort of, by the end, holds new meaning. But if you already know where it's going, you feel it more essentially. So, okay. so that the the character stuff is more resonant because of it. Okay, but like for those of you who haven't seen it, the ending that everybody loves to spoil that has just become like this great big classic, sort of like Sixth Sense became or uh, Planet of the Apes. Yeah, I was gonna say it's very similar to the you know shaking of the fist of Planet of the Apes. You know, there's a couple you know things, and this is certainly one of those you know like almost a meme in a way. You know, we all know it. You know? Yeah. yeah. Except for Eric. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. I don't know it. I'll definitely check it out. Oh yeah. Well, uh, while you're discussing your ignorance, why don't you share with us? <laughs> <laughs> okay, fine. Top two. Number three, All the President's Men. All the President's Men. A uh, movie with uh, Dustin Hoffman and Robert Redford, uh, two reporters that basically broke uh, the Watergate. I'm not even sure what the Watergate was. Like, at one point, like, they're kind of... <laughs> <laughs> well, well, it's called it, it, the Watergate. Whatever. <laughs> is, there, is there a flood? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> of information. <laughs> oh, right. And uh, I did like the the film a lot, just because it was these two reporters that are scratching, that are trying to find the truth, and both of them are working in collaboration, and even with their editor, that's starting to feel the pressure and. At one point, he's basically coming into the office so virtually in his pajamas. And uh, they're saying, look, this is what we have. This is what we have. Are we printing? And the guy's like, okay, we're printing. And I like that. I like the feel. I like the energy of that film. And I remember I was too young to grasp all of the politics behind it. But if there's one thing that I kind of related to it uh, was that energy. Both of them are really excited and they're talking and and it was interesting. Dustin Hoffman and uh, Robert Redford playing off each other and it worked. Oh, yeah. There was a good combination. No, 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 for sure. um, you know, one of the interesting things about documentary film is always that you know it's a question of access. You know, if you've got a person who can get you access, you can see a new and interesting world. You know, and one of the things I like about this film is really like you get that access to what it feels like. You know, and I've never been in that, but you feel like you're in the business of making a story and yeah. like what a story is, you know, like maybe more in Aaron Sorkin's new, new television show, you know, like any, they do it in a compressed time zone. It was, I think less than a decade from when the whole Nixon tapes and Watergate tapes, you know, like, yeah, broke, yeah. you know what I mean? So in terms of ripped from the headlines, you know what I mean? And like research had, couldn't be done on the internet then, you know what I mean? So like the research to even do this, you know what I mean? is done laboriously, you know what I mean? And, and, that's and to watch it be done is interesting. You know what I mean? And yeah. you see them, conflicted morally, you know, scared for their lives, realizing how big a story this might be, and it becomes like a spy thriller, when really all it is is like, not all it is, but it's like two people trying to do their job, and yeah. believing in their job, and believing the importance of it, and it, it becomes inspiring, it's a really good film. I and what I like about the pairing of both of them is at one point Dustin Hoffman kind of rewrites the story that Robert Redford wrote, and Dustin Hoffman is kind of defending, saying like, it's better if you bring it, and he's like, you're right, it is better. 
I just don't like the way you did it. And he acknowledges that, okay, this kid actually has talent, like he's writing really well. And both of them kind of collaborate and, okay, these are your strengths. These are your weaknesses. I'm strong at this. You're good. Okay, let's work together. And they become like a real powerful duo. Yeah. A dynamic duo. Ooh. I find it interesting that you brought up Batman. <laughs> <laughs> But more interesting that Chris brought up Aaron Sorkin. Because <laughs> I feel to a certain degree when you watch Aaron Sorkin's work that he must have been a huge fan of this yeah, movie. Probably. Because it, it really does feel like he's trying to replicate that. Like he spent an entire career sort of trying to popularize that mood that that the style sense, of that movie the sense of intelligent people doing their jobs well <laughs> yeah, yeah you know okay pick number two nobody likes this film but i love it uh barry linden mm. okay yeah okay <laughs> now i don't have what, any feelings for that movie so <laughs> nobody has any feelings for it it's a it's a superly cold film and of all of the films of stanley kubrick uh I've watched this as one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's one that I like the most. And it's weird because, uh, well, first off, it looks gorgeous. It's probably the one thing, like, he actually uh, had the, the camera and the lens perfectly made for it. One oh, of yeah, the yeah, best cameras. James Cameron in this, for yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And even beyond. And the images that you see on screen are spectacular. But not just that. Like, and the film is cold. It's a cold film. It's very detached. Uh, but at the same time, it's about this young man trying to rise to power. He just wants to do something with his life. It has a lot of humanity, as much as it's probably the coldest film I've ever seen. I still watch it and constantly discover things. And to my opinion, it's one of those films that not a lot of people appreciated uh, when it came out. And I still think, to this day, not to the full value. I know most people are going to say Clockwork Orange or... Yeah, yeah. No, I was actually surprised that if you went Kubrick, uh, Stanley Kubrick, you didn't go with Clockwork Orange. I thought that was interesting. I like it, but Barry Lyndon affects me more. Like, that's the one film that I saw, and and I was a teenager when I saw it. I'm like, what is this film? Ah, it's so long. Why is it that it's annoying? And I, just, <laughs> I know, it, it's annoying, it's cold. And the more I watched it, I was like, why is it I'm still watching it? It, and I remember the first time I rented it, it's one o'clock in the morning. I'm like, why am I still watching it? Yeah, like okay, five more minutes. And by the end, it was two o'clock in the morning. I finished it and it was a weird sensation. And this is the one thing that I like where I was in front of a piece of art where mm -hmm. I couldn't figure it out. Like I didn't have the language to interpret it. To this day, there's still things that I'm kind of grasping at. But it's like, ah. Eh. What is this? I, I don't get how to interpret it, but it's still reeling inside of me. Did you consciously like it the first time you saw it? Not really, but I kept thinking about it. And that was the one thing that I realized I am affected by this. I'm affected by this movie. So Why is it that I'm still thinking about it? Why is it that I still have scenes that, ah, oh, this reminds me of this? Then here's a question that's maybe a little bit broader. So then... Your reaction is good. It's the type of reaction I, I like to see. You know, when people don't like something, if they don't like something strongly, they should still have an opinion. You know what I mean? You yeah. didn't like something, you react, you're reacting to it. But the fact that you're reacting to it and don't understand your feelings, do you think then, is that the definition of a failed piece of art? If it could... No, if, because if, at that point, I realized could, I didn't have the language. Okay, because my, you know, just to finish the argument, like my, in my mind, you know what I mean? Like a, a strong piece of art should almost educate the viewer and give you the de like the vocabulary by the end of it to kind of interpret your feelings. You know what I mean? If, if they go short, they almost don't meet their own needs or, you know what I mean? Their thesis for themselves is flawed. You're right, and, but it's also about age, right? If I give like, a, let's say a 10 year old War and Peace to read, he might, he's going to read it and maybe yeah. he's going to get at it, but is he okay. truly going to understand it? There's a question of age. There's a question of experience. There's a question of, I haven't been exposed to that much. I realized I was too young, but at the same time, it was interesting to see the effect that it had on me. 
No, I, I agree completely with what you're saying, Eric. Uh, I think if you don't temper it with a sort of certain limitations that an audience will have because of age, maturity, or the stage of life they are in, uh, we move into an argument where all, all art must address all people. And then you end up addressing the most uh, common denominator, which leads to stupid art, to be perfectly honest. Yeah, well, listen, a scary movie... Uh... <laughs> 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 um, no, no, no. I'm, it's one of those movies that, because you know it's Kubrick, you know, I've taken it home, i rented it like three or four times. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. it, as kind of like, you know, like the seven movies for whatever price, you know what I mean? It's like, oh, I don't know what my seventh movie is going to be. And I'll take that one because I know I'm supposed to watch it. And it's always the one I don't watch. But I bought it recently and I watched it about two or three times. And to even as I watched it, I kept on discovering a lot of things. I'm like, holy cow, this is really good. I'm kind of curious. How many times did you watch it before consciously liking it? Before you realized, my God, I love this movie. I used to work at a video store, so I would watch everything. And uh, every now and again, I would see that poster. And if you've seen the poster, it's basically the guy's leg and there's a flower dropping. And, you know, you, you see basically the, the hand and the gun, the, the pistol, if you will, that's stretching. And I kept seeing that image. It's a good poster. And I uh, kept seeing the image and I must have watched easily four or five times mm -hmm. and i remember i was at the gym and at one point like uh, you know they have those tvs on the treadmill and uh, they had the bravo and it is barry linden that's playing on bravo tv and i was like my god i remember basically every frame of this film like kubrick frames this thing so well like uh, and whenever you see anything by him you're like wow this this image actually sticks and really the ideal way to see them is on the small little screen <laughs> I, know, I know but but that's funny and that that was about uh, what 20 years after i saw it like as a teenager and i went and bought it watched it again and i was like wow this is still good. You know, you were talking about the surface. You were talking about like there's something beneath there and, you know, we don't really see. Uh, I knew it. I knew I was scratching surface with this film. I knew there was something. I knew there was something about that film and it truly affected me. I, I, I have to say, first of all, that I, I love the way you're sort of talking about this movie. Uh, mm -hmm. I love the passion. And to sort of link it to the broader question you're asking, Chris, I think that's that's precisely what makes a great piece of art um, uh, resonant and important and, and successful despite not necessarily communicating its full message to certain audience members. The fact that Eric, even if he didn't understand everything that was being communicated to him, understood that something was being communicated to him. Because uh, I guess it's the tone. Uh, I guess it's the tone of the film that he has and it's like, Okay, this feels important. I think so, because your experience of uh, Berlin reminds me very much of my experience of uh, F. Cost Fitzgerald's The Great Gatsby, like the mm. book. Mm. I read that thing maybe 16, 17 times, and I can yeah, tell you yeah. without, yeah. like, I hated it the first six times I read it, and I was a teenager when I first read it. It wasn't until the sixth, seventh time when I was in my mid 20s that I started really appreciating it. Now it's one of my all time favorite books. How can it not be? Yeah, absolutely. And it really is a sense of that. Why did I read like a 200, 300 page book five times, even though I hated it? Because I knew there was something I wasn't getting and that was worth getting to, even though I had no idea what it was. Well, these are two similar pieces of work from what I understand of them. Like they're both written with high gloss, so to speak. Yeah. You know, Gatsby, the writing of it was done as, in a very stylized manner. You know what I mean? Right. Like every word is chosen, the colors are important. You know, and the same thing with everything Kubrick does, and especially this one, from what I understand of it, it's very deliberate, perfectly framed, you know, so it's just as glossy, so to speak. And, you know, and I guess this is what you're talking about, where there's this sense of, like, distance and, like, you know, like, frozenness, you know what I mean? Like, so it's like, how do you crack that? When do you, like, and what's hiding under the surface? You know what I mean? Like, is it nothing? <laughs> you know, and that's what you're wondering. Like, you know, is, and that's my question. It's like, do you think it's failed? You know what I mean? Did they have a vision and they thought that this thing... Like, the frame would be enough to tell you, you know what I mean? But if the frame is enough to just distance you, then it fails, you know what I mean? Right. You know, but, but no, I, you know, I think they're kind of very similar in terms of spirit, you know what I mean? Like right. they've, I guess the best way pieces. I can explain it is I had, 
I felt like the movie was talking to me very seriously, but it was in a foreign language. Mm -hmm. And it was just what I picked up was the tone. I'm like, okay, this is serious. I don't have I don't have the language. I don't have the vocabulary. I don't have like any of the structure to understand it, but I get the tone. I get that this is serious and I, there's a big meaning behind it. And it took me years to kind of learn the language of that and it's a bit the same way of even though I was reading English reading the Great Gatsby it took me a while to gain the experience to gain the how can I say like just experience of life yeah. to actually truly yeah. understand it you know to live to have girlfriends to have like disappointments and all sorts of things and to embarrass yourself or to have dreams that didn't really get accomplished or to have other things that did get accomplished and then next thing you know you're kind of like ah i get this now yeah no i agree so that's my second film <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the first film, uh, obviously, Godfather Part 1 and 2, because I kind of consider it <laughs> one film. Do you? I find them so different. They are different, but at the same time, like, it is the same story. Mm -hmm. uh, I like uh, Godfather 1. Uh, Marlon Brando, I think, is brilliant in it. He was probably one of the most natural actors that ever lived. And it's the casual way that he would go into a scene and... He just had perfect instincts and created characters that I don't think he necessarily understood sometimes. He's just like, well, I'm going to try this. The way that he gets into power is just like he's this guy that fixes problems. Yeah. Oh, and it's the minor things where, oh, my dog is yapping at, the, okay, I'll fix it. <laughs> and he does it. That's the one thing that you kind of realize the guy's a good boss. Yeah, Basically, yeah. like, whatever concern you have fine, I'll take care of you. Mm. And that's the one thing that I kind of realized that was endearing. And interestingly enough, uh, what De Niro does in the second part, it's probably the best yeah. actor that played a prequel to a, a character that was bigger than life, Marlon Brando, playing the, the Godfather. And he does something very different, and he does it on his own. He creates a new character that a lot of other actors that are doing prequels or whatever don't do. No, they'll just try and imitate the one. Exactly. Yeah. They yeah. kind of yeah. get it for the last scene. Oh, come on. I think you're shortchanging Ewan McGregor's role as Obi-Wan Kenobi. <laughs> he tried, but <laughs> no. uh, yeah. I'm kidding. <laughs> he was the best part of the prequels. He was. He was the MDC ones. But oh, okay. yeah. He was not an alternate. Though. But that's it. And uh, Al Pacino, before he became Al Pacino. Yeah. Before he became that kind of character of like, hoo and all of that. Brilliant instincts. I love the way he acted with his eyes. And just that scene where uh, he's in the restaurant and, you know, he does what he does. Uh, it's brilliant. It, you know, there's about five minutes on him and the tension is incredible. I love Al Pacino in especially the first Godfather because he's so quiet. Like you mentioned, before he became the, the larger-than-life uh, uh, street philosopher, sort yeah, of exactly. character that he is, the, here was a man who thought as much as, you know, the Al Pacino character that we know, but kept it to himself, exactly. you know? Yeah, exactly. Uh, but this film, like, I thought was very interesting in showing, like, what was the Italian-Americans, well, this view, this story that they yeah. would tell. They, it's very it's not no, Exactly, <laughs> but... It's also about the story that they tell to each other. Mm. And I always find that interesting. Borges said, like, uh, you know, the literature of the people is their dreams. Yeah, well, it's, it's written, you know what I mean, as, a, as an, almost an urban myth. You know what I mean? Like but that's what I like. And this is so it, and it's got that growth and that pattern and that pace. And, yeah. and it, it works really well. Like, my favorite from those two is really number two. Yeah, uh, I love you know, number two. Like Chris, um, I prefer Godfather 2 to Godfather 1. In fact, Godfather 2 was in my list of top three. And I've just decided that I will tell you why Godfather 2 made the list and Godfather 1 did not. I find Godfather 1 cheats. I find Godfather 1 portrays the mafia in, in such a way that is just too difficult to believe. They want you to sympathize with the mafia in this movie, so they make them into saints. 
You know, they're like, oh, we don't deal with drugs because that's that ruins people. It's like you're the mafia. You kill people. I, I don't think you care that much. But isn't what they say? They say they don't want to deal with drugs. No, they actually say why. It's sort of a cheat in a way that it's sort of like, well, you're not rooting for the mafia. You're rooting for the good mafia people. Eh, come on now, you know? Like No, I agree. Whereas the second one sort of reframes all of that and places it in the context of a tragedy where it's sort of like, no, what, what we're trying to communicate is that Don Corleone was sort of deluded in his thinking that he was a good person. He was fixing problems and he crossed moral lines but didn't really realize and that trickles down. Like his son, who's essentially a good person, his moral choices are completely warped because of that. But I do feel the second one benefits because of that build up in the first one of the family. You know, yeah. like, and then the number of meals they have together and the sense of the, you know, the group and the, the support and, you know, like, we'll do this for each other. And, you know, like, we are good at heart, but this is just what we do. You know, like, in, if you didn't have that whole movie to build that up, you know, I do feel like you wouldn't quite have the tragedy of the second one. No, it is definitely a sequel. Yeah. Yeah. But w what's interesting is, you kind of touch on it, where they're locked in it. It's very stagnant. It's this world where everybody has a role and it, you can't deviate. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the Al Pacino tries that by going into the army and everything else, but he gets pulled back in. And when he does take over, it's kind of twisted and it, it talks about generation, you know, where you think your values of one generation and then the other one, nah, they see it differently. And their spin that they're going to have on things is completely different and sometimes more horrific. I agree with you. It does kind of glorify like the the mafia. And you had a lot of Italian-Americans that would say the same thing. Mm. Oh, the Godfather. Like, that's, that's us. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm part of the mafia too. And mm. sounded interesting. And yeah, I guess it's something that's alluring right like it's uh you know criminals with guns and it's like oh that's exciting it's a lot better than somebody doing taxes obviously like italian americans are not shooting each other and they're not like in the mafia or stuff like that but they wanted to instill fear well instill fear it's not like batman but uh <laughs> <laughs> wow <laughs> Interesting parallel. Indeed. Uh, we are running really <laughs> long. So what we're going to do is we're going to end this episode right now and tune in next week where Chris and I were, are going to share our <laughs> top we'll, three. We'll be really short. <laughs> yeah, we'll, be really short. <laughs> we'll just name them. <laughs> so if you want to comment, post your thoughts about uh, the discovery of an artistic piece or just <laughs> Nick and Eric's choices, <laughs> Um, write us at mail@thedreamersedge.com or post a comment at thedreamersedge.com, and we will see you next week with more best of the seventies. <laughs>